place where our faith is tested and real and life-changing. And so, Lord, this morning, may we recognize the gifts you've given us, the gifts of love and mercy through Jesus Christ, the gift of belonging to you and being part of your family. And may we step out of our comfort zone and into your arms, into that life of blessing and hope that you have for us. So right now, Lord, help us to hear your voice as we open your word in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it always begins with a story. He was a young preacher, a little country church outside the big city, and he was excited about God, excited about speaking for God, and the church loved him, and he loved the church, and and since he was a, a young single preacher and, and people, you know, all the little ladies wanted to set him up with their granddaughters and stuff like that. But he picked this one particular young lady in the congregation that, that uh, he said, this is the one for me. And didn't make all the little ladies happy because, well, this young lady had a past. She had a past. And, and, and they were, you know, some of those people said, you know, preacher, you can do better. You know, you should think more about that. And he said, no, this is the one I think God wants me to marry. And so they got engaged and the church made the plans and the celebration. And, and, and you know, their wedding was like the big event for the year because uh, of all the excitement about it. And there they were, the new young couple. And, and he's the young preacher and he's preaching the word with passion and the church is responding. And Everything seems great, and then they find out she's pregnant. Wow, so exciting, a new family, and, and the preacher and his young wife are expecting, and it's going to be awesome, and, and, and everything's just, just wonderful. They have their baby, and the, you know, there's all the baby showers and all the celebrations, all the little ladies knitting booties and blankets and, uh, and everything that, that goes with that. And, and, and as time went on, he continued to preach the Word of God. The church continued to respond to him. But at home, you know, uh, there, there's some problems. There, there were some of those rocky places, and, uh, and, and so his wife started missing, you know, being at church with her husband sometimes. And, and there were those people who kind of whispered and, and, and talked about, you know, maybe she was uh, visiting some of her old friends. And, uh, you know, there were whispers. They weren't going to say them out loud. They weren't going to make any accusations. They just kind of talked about it amongst themselves, and, and then about the time it was getting problematic, they found out that the, the preacher's wife was pregnant again, and so that kind of like changed the dynamic. She started showing up in church more, and, and everything, you know, was, was kind of going on a lot better, and, and uh, people were planning the more of the showers, but, you know, the second time around, it's not nearly as big a deal, and uh, so, you know, they already got all the baby stuff. And, uh, but there were a few people who were kind of whispering, you know, they never say it out loud, of course, not to any, where anyone would hear, and definitely not to the preacher, but they're kind of whispering and just wondering if the baby was his. And, and then time came for the baby to be born, and the baby was born, and, and the family looked like the picturesque little family, and, and everything was going well um, until it wasn't. And, and now as things began to, to degenerate in their relationship, uh, it got rockier and his wife pretty much dropped out of church altogether. And, and now people weren't whispering about her lifestyle and her choices. She, you know, they were just talking about it out loud that she had pretty much started hanging out with the old crowd. And, you know, it, it was awkward because when people would see them as a family in public, they really didn't want to talk to them. They really didn't want to, you know, because it just, they didn't know what to say. Because everybody talked about him after they passed on by. That poor preacher and his wayward wife. And, you know, and he knew there were problems. He'd come home and she'd left the kids with sitters and she was gone. And he didn't know who she was with or where she was. And, and things were really getting tough. And, and then um, they found out she was expecting again. And now people weren't really whispering. They just were kind of saying, yeah, it's, it's not even his. It's not his. And they're all kind of holding their breath in the church. What's this preacher going to do with this with his wife who, who's, who's treating him like this and with this baby that probably isn't his? And, and how's he going to respond? And, and for a season, it looked better because his wife started coming to church again, although nobody really talked to her and she didn't talk to anybody. And she really didn't even look at anybody. 
And so she was there, and, and things seemed to be getting better, but the church was just kind of holding its breath. And the time came for the baby to be born, and, and the baby was born, and the preacher just said, this is my child, and I, and I love him. The church was kind of stunned by his mercy and his love and, and everything, and they thought, surely now she'll change. Surely now she'll be that wife that you think she wanted to be. But it didn't take long. Really just a couple of months and she was back worse than before. She wasn't even pretending now. She would just leave the kids for hours upon hours. She would stay out late. Sometimes she wouldn't come home at all. And people started coming to the preacher and saying, what are you going to do about this situation? And he said, well, she's my wife and I'm going to love her. They just shake their head at their young preacher who didn't have the sense to throw her out. They didn't have to because it wasn't long until she just came home, packed her bags, and left with her boyfriends for the big city. So years passed. He raised the kids. He pastored the church. He continued to preach the word of God with integrity. That From time to time, the leaders would come to him and just say, hey, pastor, it's been a while. Why don't you just go ahead and make this official? Why don't you just divorce her? She left you. She cheated on you. Everybody knows that. Just You you can still be our pastor because we love you and we know your heart. And he said, no. I chose her, and I'm going to love her. She's my wife. They just shake their head and go on and... And things progressed. The kids grew up, and he was a great dad, and he was a great pastor, and, and the years passed. And, and uh, one day, he had to go into the city, and he didn't like going into the city, he didn't like being there, didn't like being around uh, a lot of the busyness, and he got turned around. And, and while he was there, he got lost. Okay, He ended up in the wrong part of town. And he didn't know how he got there, and he didn't know how to get back to where he wanted to be, so he's trying to figure it out. And as he rounded a corner... That event that he had imagined but never expected happened. Because there she was, across the street, just a few feet away from him, his wife. She was dressed uh, according to her profession, shall we say, because it was no longer a hobby. It was business. And uh, the years had not been kind to her. She had been used and abused and It showed. She wasn't alone. She was with her manager. He looked nervous because he figured out right away who this guy was by the way that uh, his uh, friend reacted. And, And so he wasn't sure what was about to happen. But the preacher and his wife, their eyes met just for a moment. And she couldn't look at him. She dropped her head and all the shame and the guilt of the years um, and hoped he would go away. And her manager just kind of looked nervously as this young preacher, who wasn't so young anymore, had a conversation with somebody who wasn't there. And then he began to walk towards them. Now, the manager was really nervous. He wasn't sure if he was going to have to fight or run or what. And and the preacher's wife couldn't bear the weight of what was to come. And she just kind of sank to her knees right there in the street. And she waited for those words of condemnation, of, of abuse, of I told you so, of you could have had a life. Look at you now. But instead, she heard her husband say, how much? How much? Her manager didn't know what to say. He just kind of goes, hey, man, she's your wife. You can have her. And the preacher said, no, not for an hour, but for always. How much? Manager shrugged and was like, well, she's old and useless anyway, and he named a price. Preacher dug into his pocket, and he brought the money out, and he gave it to him, and the manager left. Now it's just the two of them, preacher and his wife. And now she waits for the tirade, for the anger, for the 
uh, all of the hurt to be visited upon her. She's waiting for it just all to be over with. She doesn't know if it's, the assault is going to be verbal or if it's going to be physical. But instead of a backhand across her face, she feels the gentle touch of her husband's fingers under her chin and he lifts her head up until their eyes meet once again. And she is shocked because she doesn't see anger, she doesn't see hatred, she doesn't see condemnation. She sees love. She sees mercy. And he gently lifts her to her feet and he says, you're my wife and I love you. And I'm going to take you home and I'm going to let you heal and I'm going to let you be restored so that you can be the person that God created you to be. That's the story. And it's true. Okay, I embellished it a little bit. But it's the story of Hosea chapters 1 through 3. It's the text for today's message, and if you don't know where Hosea is, it's in the Old Testament. It's right after the book of Daniel. It's called one of the minor prophets, and it's the first one. But I just want you to read or to hear one verse this morning specifically out of this because it kind of frames the entire book. Chapter 1, verse 2, it says, When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take to yourself a wife of whoredom, and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. And that verse, that one verse, and throughout the book, God defines the betrayal. The betrayal. Now, we understand the story of Hosea and his wife, and we get the betrayal because she cheated on him. She was unfaithful to him. And so we understand that betrayal of adultery. But that betrayal of Hosea's wife is a picture so that we can understand the betrayal of God's people. See, here's what happened. The Lord had rescued the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. They'd been in Egypt over 400 years. They had become slaves. They had no rights. They had no freedom. And God sent Moses to lead the children of Israel out of slavery and into the promised land. And God did it by demonstrating his power and performing miracle after miracle after miracle. And they arrived in the promised land and God gave them the commandments. And he said, here's how I want you to live as my people. I want you to worship me only, and I want you to be faithful to me. In fact, if you read the Old Testament, you'll see that God really defines a relationship between him and the nation of Israel as a husband to a wife. And how did the people respond to all of God's power and all of God's blessings? Well, the people worshipped other gods. That's what they did. Specifically, they were worshiping a god called Baal, B-A-A-L, who was the, one of the Canaanites' gods. Those are the people who lived around the Israelites. And God had warned them not to, to get entangled with these other gods of the other nations. And Baal was a fertility god. And so they, people worshipped Baal so they could be successful with their crops. So that their livestock would have lots of babies. And so that they would have lots of children. That's what, you know, the fertility thing was all about. They wanted to have more. And so they worshipped Baal. But understand, when you worship a fertility god, you worship them sexually. It was a sexual worship experience. They made sexual sacrifices. And so the Baal followers, the people who were being faithful to Baal and wanted Baal to bless their lands, they would send their daughters to work in the temples at the altars in the high places for Baal, and they would serve as temple prostitutes. You say, what do you mean temple prostitutes? What I mean is that men would come to the altars of Baal, and they would pay an offering, and they would have sex with the priestesses. That was the worship of a fertility god. So can you understand why God is upset? Can you understand why God is, is angry at his people? Because here he's blessed them, and he's delivered them, and he's freed them, and he gave them ten commandments, and they're breaking two of them right there because they're worshiping other gods, and they're committing adultery. And what's really disgusting is that in the worship of Baal, the people prostituted their children. 
Now, I hate to say it that way, but there's really no other way to say it. Because a good religious family that, that honored Baal because they wanted Baal to bless their homes, their lands, their crops, their livestock, all that kind of stuff, would send their daughters to go be temple prostitutes. Can you, can you just imagine that going away party? Okay, happy harlotry. Here it is. Time for you to go and give yourself to these men as they worship Baal. We're so proud of you. Yeah, I mean, doesn't that repulse you? We, we look at that and we go, this is sick. This is twisted. And it was one of those daughters that Hosea was told by God to marry. See, she wasn't like some sleazy streetwalker uh, that everybody looks at and, and turns away from. No, we're, we're talking about there was no shame. There was no sorrow. There was no dismay. She was just doing what a good religious Baal worshiper did. And Hosea married her. But she was being faithful to Baal and not to the Lord. And then, of course, the fathers went to Baal to worship. And, and they took their sons, who had become adults at the age of 13, along with them to be engaged in this practice. The parents led their children to be engaged in this disgusting, idolatrous practice. Hey, does anybody here want to be those kind of parents? Yeah, I didn't think so. You see, we're repulsed by this practice. We want to protect our children, right? <laughs> well, maybe not. <laughs> Let me ask you again. We want to protect our children, right? Yeah. yeah. Because I know that the dads out here with daughters, if somebody came and said, hey, why don't you, give, you know, send your 14-year-old to be a prostitute, you'd probably hurt that person. Okay, you want to protect your kids. You don't want to prostitute your children. And yet, when we really are honest, we are tempted to prostitute our kids. You see, we live in a culture that gives lip service to the living God. Right? A culture that honors Jesus Christ by celebrating his birthday, even if we don't really make him the big deal about it. And that recognizes that we should be out of school, you know, to celebrate his death and resurrection, although we've kind of moved that around based on our calendars. You see, our culture gives lip service to God, and yet we worship many other gods. We worship gods of money, we worship gods of materials, we worship gods of power, and yes, we worship gods of sex. We live in a culture that is saturated with sexuality, that perverts and corrupts our children. So we need to talk for a little bit about how we, we may be prostituting our children, how we un Oh, uh, being unaware of our actions, being unaware of our choices, being unaware of our activities that may be leading our children to worship at these gods of sexuality rather than at the feet of the living God. What are we talking about? Well, first of all, let me talk to the men, to the fathers in this room. Guys, this is for you. Ladies, you can listen in. Men, we prostitute our children through pornography. Our culture is porn saturated. You guys realize that pornography is a $13 billion a year industry? $13 billion a year. Do you realize that the average age of a, a male's first exposure to pornography is 12 years old? And it's getting younger every year. Also, 50% of men who go to church admit that they have a problem with porn. So guys, let me ask you a question, and yes, I actually do want you to respond. Men, do you want your sons to be porn addicts? Do you really want to destroy your marriage and your relationship with your wife? Men, do you want your daughters to be a porn star? You see, this is where you're leading your family and your children if you're using porn. See, I challenge you to break the cycle. I challenge you to build your marriage. I challenge you to bless your children, to lead them to follow Christ. And the only way to do that is to destroy the secrecy and to invite accountability into your life. Secrecy. 50% of the men admit to having a problem with porn. 
I think the other 50% probably are liars. So they don't admit to anything. You see, this is a struggle. And, and here's the thing. Our culture doesn't see anything wrong with pornography at all. Our culture thinks that, oh, it's good, it's healthy, it's fun, it's no big deal. And, and yet it's destroying the lives of our kids. And we're taking them along for the ride if we're participating in porn. And what happens in church is this. This is the cycle. You know, guys who love Jesus and who want to honor God with their families and they, and they want to bless their families. And, and they're tempted by porn and they stumble and they, and they get involved in it. And then they, they feel guilty and they repent. They say, God, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to give my life to you. And, and, and they mean it. And for a while they break that cycle, whether that's a day, whether that's a week, whether that's a month or a year or a decade. And, and then they slip up. And again, they, they, they fall into the temptation of porn, and, and then they repent, and, and they mean it, and then they slip up. And they get in a cycle because we don't tell anybody. Because we're embarrassed, we're ashamed, and we're guilty, and we don't want anyone to know that we can be that kind of a scum-sucking pig sinner. And yet we are. And God knows it, and guess what? You're impacting your families by doing this. So here's the challenge. I challenge every man in this room to guard your heart, your family, and your children by installing accountability software on every single computer device that you or your family members have access to. Computers, tablets, phones, gaming systems. Do you realize that, you know, that uh, Xbox has internet access, therefore your kids may not just be playing Guitar Hero or shooting things? Accountability software. How do you do that? Well, on your sermon notes, on the back side, I've listed three websites you can go to. They're not the only three websites. They're just three that we use here at the church. X3 Watch, which is great for your PC or your Android. Covenant Eyes, which is, works the same way as Xbox does. One called Accountable to You, which works great for Mac. It's what I use on my iPad. And by the way, what I'm challenging you is what I do. It's what all the males on our staff do. It's not an option to be part of the ministry leadership here. Because we're going to safeguard our lives, our hearts, our families by doing this. And it blesses us and it will bless you. Because if you don't have accountability, you're going to face temptation. If you don't have accountability, at some point you're going to lose. If you have accountability and you know you've got to give an answer to somebody... You're a whole lot more careful. And by the way, this isn't just about you. This is about you protecting your children. You say, well, I don't have kids at home. Well, yeah, do they ever come visit you? Do your grandkids ever come visit you? Guess what? They know how to get online. They know how to use your devices. We're talking about protecting your family from being corrupted by the world and what the world wants them to get a hold of. So I'm just challenging you flat out to do this. If you want God to change your life, to build your marriage, to bless your children, then embrace accountability. By the way, one of the things that we've kind of discovered is that people who reject accountability usually are hiding something. So men, let's lead our families to follow Jesus. The ball is in your court. Now ladies, as a father to two girls... I got a lot to say to you. Really do. But I've decided to yield to one of your peers. Uh, I've asked a mom that has two kids at home that uh, has a good marriage and that you know loves your kids as well as her kids to kind of share this sermon with me. So I've asked uh, our children's minister, Julie Garnis, to help me preach this sermon. And so I yield to her. Thank you. Sing on. Hi. How are you guys doing? Okay, I'm going to start with this. I know I'm going to offend, and I'm probably going to make some of you feel uncomfortable, and that is totally not my intention. I want to make everyone happy and feel great all the time. Um, but I want to shine some light on some issues that us as women deal with and what some of our children might be dealing with on a daily basis. First, let me talk about myself a little bit so you become comfortable and connect with me. I am from the Midwest. Is there any Midwesters out there? Okay, hi. Do you remember when um, you lived back there and dressing up at the grocery store meant wearing like a matching set of pajamas? Do you remember that? Okay. I thought I was dressed up when I was wearing matching pajamas. Well. I moved here after um, meeting my husband on vacation about, oh, when I was 22 years old. Moved here, uh, two years later we got married. We've been married for 10 years now. We have a five-year-old daughter and a six-year-old son. 
When I moved here, I was a little bit in culture shock, number one, because dressing up at the grocery store didn't mean wearing matching pajamas. It meant wearing a really hot swimsuit with a cover-up over it. <laughs> Thongs were no longer flip-flops. And pasties were not the German pot pies that I used to get. I was so confused. Needless to say, I, I really did have some culture shock. And to be honest with you guys, it initiated some body image issues for myself. And if we're being completely honest with each other, woman to woman, we've all got it. At least almost all of us do. Studies across the board show that 80% of women look at their bodies and are disgusted and don't agree with what the mirror says. They don't like them. We have over 13 negative ideas or, or um, thoughts about our bodies every single day. That's one per waking hour. We feel like we need to be augmented here, liposuction there, lifted here. The list goes on and on, guys. You know what I'm talking about, right? I'm not the only one. And don't get me wrong, I dig fashion. I dig the chunky necklaces. I like having my hair done. I like my nails gold and sparkly. And I try to live a healthy lifestyle. But what I don't dig is the teen suicide rate that's running rapid in our city right now. I don't dig that so many women have all of these body image issues. And I really don't dig that over 8 million Americans suffer with an eating disorder. 7 million of them are women. Do you want to know another terrible statistic that I don't even like to say? 60% of our kids that are at a normal body weight think they are fat. And I've been talking to them all weekend. It's real. And it's taking place right in front of us. We have issues. And we're unfortunately passing them down to our kids. And none of us want to admit or take on the responsibility of doing that. I know I don't want to. And by the way, I'm not pointing fingers. I'm asking questions to myself and all of us mothers in here. I want to ask some questions for us to discuss with God and ourselves. Number one, how do we dress? What are we wearing in front of our kids and other people that we should only wear in front of our husbands? Do we teach and model modesty to our kids? Do they even know what the word modesty means? What activities do we have our girls in? Are we really okay with our little six-year-olds moving and dressing like the cowboy cheerleaders? Who dictates what our kids wear, what they say, how they act, what they do? Do we leave that up to the coaches and to our teachers? Or is that our job? Because the last time I checked, God gave us that responsibility. No, he really did. I can tell you where one of our issues lies. We like to point fingers and say that it's this fault. But it is a little bit. Society stinks. Let me show you a little picture. See anything wrong here? Look real close. <laughs> okay, so kids eat free every Saturday at Hooters, so Hooters is a family restaurant now. This, earlier this week, we were in Phoenix for our staff retreat, which is great times. And um, we, it was time to go to dinner. Don't worry, we didn't go to Hooters, okay? Don't start that rumor. We went next door, and this was next to us, and I just had to take a picture because I was laughing a little bit, but then I, like, wanted to cry because this is acceptable, and it's okay, and we bring our kids here. It's because the chicken wings are so good, right? But we're not going there for the chicken. We're going there for the chicks. The waitress's job there is to dress up all sassy, right, and to serve you. The jobs as a mom... One of them that we have to take serious is we need to show our kids that they should honor God in the way that they dress, in the way that they live. None of us want to prostitute our children. And when Pastor Chad said that, every single service back here, I cringe. Like, no, I don't even want you to say that. It makes us feel uncomfortable. It's disgusting. It is. And we should cringe. But are we dressing our kids to fit into that category of prostitutes or prostitutes? <laughs> Are we, I know that we don't want to lead them to the God of Baal, the fertility God, but are we leading them to the God of sexy body image? 
like I said, please don't feel like I'm pointing fingers. I'm asking myself these questions, and I am right here with you, you guys. I ask myself these questions, and I'm convicted every day. I encourage all of you moms and me to have that conversation with God this week. And I encourage you to set one day this week, plan one day to talk to your kids about this. I've given you some tools to do this inside your bulletin on the other side of the sermon notes. There's some right now media clips that you can um, watch with your kids. The first one is identity. That's awesome to watch with teens, female, and male. The other one is princess with a purpose. Don't watch that with your elementary boys. That will confuse them. (laughs) This is for girls, preschool, and elementary. So try to set some time aside with that. If you're a grandparent in here thinking, I have no influence over them, absolutely not. That's a lie. You have tons of influence. You can talk to your kids about having conversations with your kids. You can help facilitate that and be an example. My heart is breaking for our kids, you guys. They are dealing with so much stuff that we didn't even have to as little ones. Are we going to step up and fight this battle with them, or are we going to add more pressure than they already have? Thank you. (laughs) I want my daughter, my little Layla, I want her to know that she is his masterpiece, Ephesians 2.10. And I want her to know that even though everyone else might be looking at her outside appearance, God looks at her heart, 1 Samuel 16, 7. Parents, we are the only ones that stand between our kids and what the world wants to teach them and tell them. Moms, I encourage you, show your girls how important they are. Make them feel special and beautiful by accepting who you are and by not adding any more pressures to them. Love them for who they are. Show them where their beauty really lies. Thank you for letting me share with you. I love you guys, and I love your kids a lot. Thank you. Thanks. You know, thankfully, the story doesn't end with betrayal. The story of Hosea ends with redemption. And just as the story of Hosea didn't end with brokenness, ours doesn't have to either. You see, Hosea chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, God tells Hosea to go and find his wife and buy her back. And he does that. He literally goes and and negotiates a price, and he buys her back, and he takes her home, and he says, you're going to recover, you're going to be restored to that place that God wants you to have. Do you guys realize that Jesus literally bought us back through his death and resurrection? That he paid the price for our sins, our rebellion, that literally he paid for our spiritual whoredom? So today, because we don't want to leave you in that place of guilt of, oh, I failed, I messed up, I've done these things, I I haven't been a good parent, all these different thoughts that may be through your mind. I want you to know today that God loves you completely. That's why he sent Jesus into this world. That's why he sacrificed his son. Even with all the mistakes you've made, all the places you've been, all the things you've done that you regret, all the filth that you've wallowed in, God is not angry at you. He's not ready to visit retribution and condemnation upon you. He wants to lift up your head and look you in the eyes and tell you, I love you love you. I love you and I want you to be with me. You see, that, that's the message that, that resonates in Hosea when you read it, it, is that God never stops loving his people even when we mess up. He never gives up on us. And so God loves you and God forgives you and wants to restore you. You see, this is amazing, but Scripture tells us this. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us, literally purify us of all unrighteousness. The Word of God tells us that the blood of Jesus cleanses us of all our sin. So whatever it is that you've done, that you're carrying that guilt around, uh, all, all the failures that you may have accumulated through your life, guess what? That's not what God's looking at. He forgives you the moment that you ask. And he wants to restore you. He wants to bless you. He wants to set your feet on solid ground. He wants you to become that man, that woman that he created you to be. 
And we know around here that God has the power to change lives. God has the power to restore families. God has the power to set you free and to make you a new creation in him. You see, we celebrate that every day. But I'm just going to tell you this. Jesus bought you back. Are you ready to come home? Are you ready to come home? Will you pray with me? Father, your love and your grace is incredible. The fact that you have redeemed us through the blood of Jesus Christ is beyond belief. And yet here we are, broken, hurting people and families. And Lord, you know all the stuff in our lives and yet you love us anyway and you want to redeem us today. So Lord, I pray that every person here would just experience your love and your mercy that is overwhelming. And God, you would bring us to that place where we will lead our families and our lives in a way that honors you and points them to Jesus. We can't do this. We can't change our lives unless you help us. So right now, we throw ourselves on your mercy and we praise you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen.